All right. It is time to get started with the webinar. Good morning, everyone from the Pacific Northwest. Hello and welcome to our first installment of our multi-part series on NIR spectroscopy. Uh, this uh, segment today is going to be more of a uh, overview of the technology itself, uh, and then a little bit about who uses it, the different types of instruments there are, how the technology itself works. Um, and then I will uh, explain what the next parts of the series are. Uh, so be sure to stay tuned to the end of the webinar. Um, some light housekeeping really quick before we get started. Um, our distributor manager, Susie Truitt, is our host today, and she is managing the chat function. So anytime we have extra information we want to provide to you, um, we will post that in the chat. If you have any questions pertaining to the content of this webinar, please put that in the Q&A function in Zoom, not the chat. So all questions, please go into the Q&A so that at the end of the webinar today, I can open that Q&A function and I can actually look through and answer all your questions one at a time. If they go into the chat, I will likely not see them. Um, but Susie will do her best uh, also to make sure that uh, if there are any questions accidentally put into the chat, they will go into the Q&A. Um, so if you are encountering any technical difficulties uh, where you can't hear me, if my presentation is uh, glitching or, or something's going wrong tech, on a technical side, uh, please uh, do put that in the chat uh, so that you can inform us that uh, something's not working correctly, you can't hear me. If you are unable to see me or see the presentation, please let us know uh, and we'll um, make sure to address that before we continue. All right, so just a quick introduction of myself. My name is Galen. I am the Director of Applied Science here at Felix Instruments. Been with the company for four years now. My background's in biochemistry and food science. Um, I uh, previously have worked in uh, uh, quality and safety assessment in the food, agriculture, and cannabis industries. Um, and so I'm really excited to talk to you today about this technology because I've had a lot of experience now with it and used it in multiple different settings. Um, and so I hope that this can provide you with some uh, great insight into uh, how this technology can be used. So let's just go ahead and start off. Uh, so what is near-infrared spectroscopy or NIR spectroscopy, sometimes also referred to as NIRS uh, as an abbreviation? Um, so from a 30,000 foot view, essentially NIR spectroscopy is shining a light source onto a sample uh, and then receiving back uh, information uh, into a detector. Uh, that then allows us to acquire uh, what we call a spectra. Now, there's a lot more uh, nuance to that. Uh, so what we'll do now is I'll talk a little bit about, um, not get into the actual physical chemistry involved in, in what's happening, but maybe a little bit more detail so that you can kind of understand uh, exactly why it's a useful tool. So when we're talking about NIR light, we're talking about light in the electromagnetic spectrum that's just out of visible range. Um, it's typically between about 780 to 2,500 nanometers uh, as far as wavelength is concerned. Um, and so in that, in those wavelengths of light, what's happening is, uh, you know, we're shining light into a, a sample. In this case, uh, uh, you know, if we're talking about commercial agriculture, then we're talking about some kind of produce uh, or uh, grains or, or whatever it may be that you're growing in your fields. Um, and we're basically shooting light into that. Um, there's multiple ways uh, that we can go about doing this. Uh, we can be looking at, as you can see in this optical geometries uh, infographic here, uh, there's a couple of different methods of, of looking at the light that, and seeing what's happening. Um, so there's specular reflection, which is just a direct reflection off the surface of whatever we're measuring. And that doesn't really give us uh, a ton of information uh, that we uh, really care that much about. Um, in some cases you might, uh, but in a lot of cases that doesn't give us uh, the amount of, of uh, information that we're looking for. Then there's diffuse reflection, 
um, which is uh, 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 something that is a little more useful, I would say, uh, for looking at uh, like things like internal quality attributes. Um, there's partial transmission or what we call interaction. Um, and, and then there's also full transmission. So transmission would require you to have a light source on one side of the fruit or, or whatever you're measuring, and then a detector on the other side with the expectation that you are going to get uh, some transmittance of uh, light uh, in the infrared spectrum uh, going through all the way through that sample. Um, in a lot of cases, that's a pretty lofty goal, um, especially if you have something like a deciduous fruit that has a pit or a uh, like a stone fruit or an avocado. Um, that can be a pretty uh, uh, hopeful uh, goal to have something go all the way through something that uh, dense and that thick. Um, so anyways, uh, with, you know, there's lots of different ways to actually, you know, measure this light. Um, but what's actually happening on a more fundamental level is, and what gives us the information that we want is the absorption of, of uh, energy at, of this light energy at, uh, you know, different wavelengths is caused by essentially uh, different strengths of different types of bonds. Now, NIR spectroscopy is more of a uh, hydrogen bond dominated technology. And so the bonds that we're looking at, these chemical bonds that we're looking at are things like OH bonds, CH bonds, and NH bonds. Um, and now each of these have different levels of strength, right? And so they require different levels of energy to activate them and, uh, and absorb that energy. So uh, when that's happening, essentially what we're seeing is different areas of this of this wa of this wavelength spectrum right from 780 to 2500 nanometers different areas where different bonds of different strengths are absorbing energy and so that's what gives us the kind of information that uh that uh we need to identify specific chemical constituents now there is uh, a little more nuance to that in that in the short wave nir spectrum we're not actually looking at fundamental vibrations of these bonds. We're not looking at the, uh, you know, the actual, or, you know, fundamental identification of, of each of these individual bonds. We're actually looking at what we call overtone bands and combination bands um, that uh, are essentially like harmonics. Like if you're thinking about frequency and like music, they're definitely like harmonics of the initial uh, the uh, initial fundamental vibration, which lies actually in the mid infrared uh, region. And so, uh, but what we get out of the NIR is even though it's so it's a little more I guess muddled. It's not as clear and concise as those fundamental vibrations that we get in the mid infrared. Um, what we get is uh, you know these some kinds of overlaps and combinations and and um, uh, these uh, absorptions at, at wavelengths where certain bonds might overlap. And so, uh, you know, what we get out of it is a spectra and we get a, a you know, and this is an example on the bottom right of a reflection spectra of different uh, types of um, avocado and mango. Um, and with this information, we can glean what kinds of chemical bonds are in the the sample that we're looking at. And so with that information, you can then imagine, well, if I know what kinds of chemical bonds are in here, I know what kinds of chemicals those might be associated with, such as sugars or water or different uh, amino acids or proteins or fat. Um, so lots of, and or even other micronutrients. So the technology itself in a hardware sense is shooting light and some kind of optical geometry, light in the near infrared to some kind of, with some kind of optical geometry setup so that it can essentially give us a spectral reading that is showing us absorption or, you know, in reverse reflection levels uh, of different chemical bonds. And typically those bonds are CH, OH, or NH bonds. Now, that is all well and good. That's, you know, we can get the spectra out of it, but that doesn't necessarily help anyone 
in the commercial agriculture sector. That's all it's doing is giving you a spectra. What do you do with that spectra? We don't, you know, there's nothing necessarily that you can do besides maybe classify samples with that. So what if you want to use it for something like quality control, or if you want to use this technology for something like uh, uh, phenotyping in the field or something like that? Well, so the question is, how do we go from acquiring that spectra to creating quantitative, getting quantitative predictions uh, of certain analytes or even just creating classification models? Um, and so the answer to that is we're going to use uh, the discipline called chemometrics. And chemometrics embodies a lot uh, of different uh, things. It's essentially just using combining, you know, mathematics and statistical analysis and uh, all sorts of other uh, computer science and other types of data analysis in order to um, give us more information about, uh, you know, chemical uh, constituents. And one of the biggest parts of chemometrics that we're going to focus more on here is multivariate data analysis. And that is the actual process we're going to go through to take the data, which is our spectra, all of these different spectra containing dozens of dozens and dozens of different uh, information about different wavelengths. Um, and we are going to take that and create a actual model that then is predicting the actual analyte level of whatever target analyte you're looking at. So in apples, for instance, um, what we're doing is we're combining data uh, from the spectra with actual um, a reference measurement. So something that you are already doing in the laboratory as a destructive means of measurement. Uh, we're combining those two together to create a, uh, a actual model. And this is also called a calibration. So you'll hear uh, those terms kind of interchanged a lot, model and calibration. Uh, calibration you'll find a lot in, in older literature and, and models is more of a, I guess, more like kind of modern data science um, term, but they're interchangeable terms. And so with this multivariate data analysis, there's a lot of routes we can take. We're not going to get really deep into this today. There's going to be actually a section on that will uh, of this uh, webinar series where we'll get more into multivariate data analysis and types of models, but um, essentially you can create you know, quantitative or non-quantitative, more qualitative models for either classification or quantification of analytes. Um, and that's how we're going to, that's how we're going to do it. And so now what we've done is we've got this technology and our spectroscopy, we've combined it with the powerful multivariate data analysis from our chemometrics discipline. And now what we have is a technology that we can, you know, send light into a sample and at the end, what we're getting, instead of just spectra, what we're actually getting is a numerical value for a certain analyte. So with this technology in mind, knowing that this is where we're at, we know that we have, we need to combine these two things. Um, what kind of devices uh, are out there and, and who's using them and, and where are they mostly utilized? Um, and so in the commercial agriculture sector specifically, um, we've got really three main sources of NIR spectroscopy. Um, we have benchtop sensors, which are typically used in things like quality laboratories. Um, these are, you know, uh, uh, you know, very uh, common because they're the the original kind of, I guess, uh, uh, invention of NIR spectroscopy. What is is benchtop laboratory device is a benchtop laboratory setup. So. Benchtop sensors, uh, typically used in the lab, uh, usually come with you know their own calibrations um, for specific uh, commodities uh, or, or specific analytes within those within a certain commodity. Um, so those are commonly just mostly used in laboratories. Uh, we have inline sensors, which are typically high throughput. Um, and they are typically not as high of resolution or accuracy as benchtop sensors uh, or portable sensors, but they are um, very high throughput. So they can they can essentially work in a sorting line to help you know classify certain types of let's say avocados uh, for dry matter or for uh, even for something like just even sorting something by color. 
uh, we have inline sensors and NIR sensors that work in that uh, capacity. Um, then we have portable sensors, uh, which is what we're going to mostly focus on um, for this webinar series. Uh, um, and so these are used at a lot of different places with, throughout the uh, supply chain. And so we've got uh, you know people that want to use them in the field for harvest uh, monitoring, people that want to use them uh, in a you know post-harvest setting, whether it be receiving incoming lots or, uh, you know, in pack houses um, when they're checking for quality uh, or, you know, even so far as importers uh, and retail outlets. Um, there's lots of different places in laboratories as well that may, maybe not, don't want to invest in the expense of a benchtop sensor. Um, the, the portable sensors are usually a more affordable option. Um, they also can be used uh, in settings like where inline sensors are used to help with uh, calibrating inline sensors. So the reason this is a Venn diagram and not three just separate points is because these all actually live, uh, you know, uh, in intersection with one another. They don't necessarily, uh, you know, exist apart. They all coexist together and they, and they can work well together, uh, uh, especially portable sensors with inline sensors, benchtop sensors supporting uh, inline sensors, uh, you know, if you need to do a, uh, a further quality check on something that uh, was giving a weird reading with another sensor, you use it as a backup. Um, so these all kind of, they aren't necessarily, they don't necessarily have to exist as separate. Uh, they can be used kind of together um, in that sense. So with the quality sensors that are portable, um, which is what we're going to focus on, uh, there's a uh, quite a few benefits, uh, one being with all these, you know, they're non-destructive technologies, right? So originally, what, whatever you were doing to test for a specific analyte was a destructive either wet lab uh, method or using some other technology that is also destructive. Um, with these uh, portable sensors are also very accurate, um, especially now that we are having such ad large advances in the multivariate data analysis uh, area. So with all these new chemometric model building techniques, um, we can increase accuracy and robustness quite a bit, uh, as well as the ongoing advancements in spectrometers themselves. And so uh, as spectrometer uh, gets smaller and, and higher resolution, we're only increasing uh, the, uh, the accuracy of, of these sensors. Um, these are versatile instruments, right? The, for those, the portable aspect of it is uh, is one of the key aspects of this, and that it can be used um, pretty much wherever you want to use it. You just take it with you, and it's and it can be used at that location. Um, and then the other thing that's really key that is often overlooked with this technology, I think, is the fact that you can collect significantly more data to more accurately inform key decisions at critical time points. So something I'm going to talk about actually in a in one of the next um, uh, sections of this webinar series is uh, coming up with sampling plans. And so, you know, in a lot of industries right now, when we're sampling, you know, we're thinking about how much we have to destroy and, and you know, the cost of, of sampling. Well, when you're doing it in a non-destructive way, the only cost is the amount of time that you have to put into it. And so if you're getting, you know, measurements in seconds and they're all non-destructive, you can collect significantly more data to more accurately inform you about the quality of your product. Um, and so building these larger databases and big data, that's kind of the future of, of where we're going with ag. And so um, being able to collect that much data without having to destroy hundreds of samples and and have the laboratory personnel and equipment needed for that such a high throughput operation um, is an uh, invaluable uh, asset. Um, and so the reason we're focusing on portable quality sensors is because uh, you know at Felix Instruments that's kind of what we are focused on. Uh, we have a line of different uh, quality meters that are commodity specific, as well as a, a more research based unit that's just an open ended um, unit that is uh, for people that want to build their own models, uh, their own calibrations. Um, but the other ones, uh, the ones that are commodity specific actually come with uh, built in calibrations so that 
is just kind of a point and click instrument uh, where you take it into the field or wherever you are and you um, want to assess, uh, you know, dry matter in avocados or dry matter in bricks and kiwi fruit and mangoes, uh, then uh, that is something that um, you can do with our sensors. And so what we're going to do with this webinar series uh, moving into the future uh, with these next sections is we're going to really be talking about, uh, you know, specifically about multivariate data analysis and model calibration, validation, deployment, um, but always giving you uh, a, a direction of it uh, that is, uh, you know, kind of how we do things in our facility and how things integrate, how those concepts integrate with our technology. Um, and so who's using these devices, right? I already kind of mentioned that people in the field or, or different points in the supply chain are using this technology, but there's actually a lot of applications out there that are maybe not necessarily what you might think. Um, so obviously uh, researchers and academics uh, that are just looking into this technology and how it can be utilized better in the industry are, are using this tech, using these portable sensors. Um, we have quality lab personnel, so uh, people that are just uh, doing quality checks, whether it be regulated um, uh, quality checks or just a uh, in-house quality lab. Uh, packers and distributors, people that uh, you know are are really concerned about uh, the quality of their uh, you know produce that is going out, uh, then they are also going to be checking that. Um, on a regular level. And so at those regular intervals, instead of destroying the fruit, they can just check it and then pack it and send it on its way. Uh, horticulturists and agronomists, people that are doing in-field studies, rapid phenotyping, um, uh, and R&D in that nature are all also, you know, utilizing these portable sensors. And then another sector that's really grown as of late are ag tech innovators, people that are looking at, especially people that look at things like new uh, coatings, right, for fruits or vegetables to extend shelf life or new packaging innovations to extend shelf life. Um, they're actually utilizing this technology so that they can assess the efficacy of their technology. So it's using one technology to validate another technology, which is really awesome and uh, great to see in the industry. So since we're talking about the Felix instrument line, um, I'll just let you guys know how exactly on the hardware end, I kind of explained in general how NIR spectroscopy works in the beginning uh, of this presentation. Um, how the 750 works uh, is on an interactance optical geometry. So I saw, I mentioned those different optical geometries that could be used, right? Reflectance, diffuse reflectance, um, interactance, uh, and so I uh, I wanted to uh, you know make sure that you guys were aware of exactly how this tech specific technology is working. So we're using a xenon lamp light source, and we're using light interactance optical geometry to obtain our spectral information from approximately 310 to 1100 nanometers. So what we're going we're doing is visible into the near infrared, but we're not into the full near infrared spectrum, right? We don't go all the way to 2500. We're just 310 to 1100 nanometers. And uh, when you are obtaining that spectra, it is not only, the instrument is not only storing that spectral, that raw spectral information on the SD card, it is also then taking that spectra, running it through the calibration that we've created, right, that's on the device um, through our multivariate data analysis. We're running it through that calibration and then spitting out a quantitative prediction on the screen. So it is a just a kind of point and click. You get the raw spectral data as well as a prediction value. And so, um, you know, we are big believers in, in big data and utilizing data as much as possible. So we want to make sure that we're not just, you know, only giving you a prediction, but that we do have the spectra available to use if we need to use it for something. And that's going to uh, come into play in an upcoming uh, webinar when we talk about uh, model development and model validation. Um, so that's how the F750 works. As you can see, here's kind of just a diagram of the internals in case uh, you've never had the opportunity to, if you are already own one and you've never had the opportunity to take one apart, 
uh, yourself uh, or see what's inside. This is kind of the setup, and this is uh, how we uh, how the internal operation of the instrument uh, it works. So we have our control board, our our storage card up, up here. The lens that where the fruit actually sits is up top here. We have our light tube, fiber optic cables here with our spectrometer, our lamps here. Um, we have a built-in reference shutter, as you guys are all aware, so that we uh, don't have to do any sort of reference scanning prior to doing our sample scans. So all of that built into the one instrument. And now you're probably wondering how we go about actually getting that calibration onto the device and how we actually develop them. Um, and so uh, this is something that we'll uh, also be including in later sections of the uh, webinar. Um, and so this is our software that we've built in-house. Uh, our lead engineer for this uh, uh, has uh, you know, worked a lot to build a intuitive uh, kind of software for building models that is optimized for uh, the 750 and 751. So uh, it says, and we have, uh, you know, tutorial videos as well as webinars uh, previously, if you're interested in learning more about how this app builder software works, um, it is uh, uh, built to easily imp allow import of the spectra files from the device. So as I mentioned, right, we, we are acquiring spectral file data files every time we take a scan with those devices. So you can easily import those and it'll import all the information necessary um, for that file, uh, including things like metadata, organizational things like your lot, um, all that stuff to keep your data well organized, which is of paramount importance uh, when you're building models. Um, and while I, I do say while it is optimized for 750 and 751 data file types, um, there is, you know, uh, uh, the the possibility of using this for non 750 and 751 spectral data. Um, if that's something that you are interested in, please uh, get in touch with me uh, um, uh, outside of this webinar, and we can discuss that. But uh, in general, what we do is is we utilize this to assess. Uh, you know, it, it, utilize it not just for the model building, but for also looking at things like model performance um, and for optimizing our models uh, for looking at, you know, looking at outliers uh, for trying out different chemometric techniques. So we no, don't just have PLS, which is kind of the traditional regression uh, model uh, type. But we also now are looking are using neural networks, which are more powerful uh, and, and more robust when it comes to um, some of the challenges associated with spectroscopy that we'll talk about uh, in, in uh, further sections of this uh, or installments of this webinar series. Um, and this uh, the nice thing about this uh, software as well uh, uh, is that it's open access. So if you have uh, uh, you know, a little bit of experience using low code. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to be a seasoned computer science professional, um, but you uh, have some, uh, you know, ability to understand logic, uh, then uh, there is uh, computer logic that is, um, there is the ability to kind of customize things uh, about the, either the display of the instrument or, or how things are calculated, what kind of spectra you're using, whether it be uh, you know, absorbance, raw absorbance, um, first derivative, second derivative, other pre-treatments uh, of data. Um, uh, or you can even, if you are, are do have a seasoned computer scientist on staff, you can do things like add in new types of uh, model building. So like if you want to try convolutional neural networks or uh, some other kind of uh, AI model building, um, then you can actually add those packages in uh, as scripts and um, and just use those in this technology in this software. So it's a really intuitive way to for us to build these models. And we'll get more into the actual process uh, in later sections. But um, this is how we create the calibrations that go into the F751s and the F750s so that um, the uh, the user can simply press the scan button and get an actual quantitative prediction on the other end. So 
coming up, I just want to kind of give you guys an overview of what is uh, to be expected from this webinar series. Today was simply just a large 30,000 foot view, right? Um, we didn't really get into too much specifics, um, but we did give a good fundamental uh, kind of background on, on how this technology works, both on the hardware level and on the uh, kind of data analysis level. And so from here, what we're gonna be doing in the next parts uh, is in part two, we're gonna be creating, talking about creating a sample plan and, and analytical testing best practices, right? Two things that really define the quality of a model um, and, are, and are often overlooked and are extremely important. Um, and so that's what we're gonna talk about next. In part three, we'll talk more about the multivariate data stuff, spectral pre-processing types of modeling, wavelength selection. Um, and that will help you uh, define, you know, the actual model that you're going to be building and uh, help you optimize, you know, get you the best model performance that you can possibly get. In part four, we'll talk about types of validation testing, relevant statistics, because um, model validation is also something that is uh, very often uh, either not done well, not done robustly enough or not done at all. Um, and so we'll talk about how you can do validation testing in a way that is going to actually um, uh, help inform you of the quality of your model. Um, and then we're going to talk about something that is has always been um, a problem in, and a challenge in spectroscopy, and that is uh, what we call calibration transfer. So taking a model from one device and putting it on another device. Um, and so we'll talk more about that in part five. And then part six is going to be model about model maintenance and optimization. So after you've deployed your model, how do you keep, how do you ensure that your model is going to keep performing as well as you want it to? And what are some uh, strategies and some techniques you can use to help make sure that the model is going uh, initially works right off the bat, you know, for you and your um, uh, team. And so that one is going to be, uh, you know, a little bit um uh, more kind of focused on the specific F751, 750 technology and some strategies you can use with our devices to help ensure, um, uh, you know, that, that the device is performing as best as it can for you. Um, so all these will have, you know, the app builder software and the F751, 750 in mind, but they also apply across the board to all types of spectroscopy um, in the commercial agriculture sector or in just in general. So, um, we really hope that you guys get a lot of, uh, you know, uh, good information out of these. And we're really excited to be talking about this topic because it's something that we, uh, you know, take a lot of uh, pride in and we take very seriously here. So we, um, yeah, we're very excited to be uh, presenting this webinar series for you guys. So that concludes uh, this uh, first part of the webinar series, uh, talking about the overview of NAR spectroscopy. So um, if you have, uh, you know, any desire to uh, maybe get some pricing information or anything like that on a 750 or a 751, you can uh, follow the link that Susie is going to post in the chat for you guys. Um, since you're not going to be able to click it on my screen, on this screen here, it'll be in the chat for you. Um, if you want to just keep updated with what we're doing and new product development uh, and stuff like that, um, please contact, uh, you know, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. Um, you can always reach us by phone. Uh, our, we do have brand new websites uh, up um, that, you know, we, we launched last year. So um, please check those out. That's where you'll always find uh, more information. If you want to join our newsletters, uh, our newsletter mailing list, then that's a great way to find out more about what's happening in the industry, as well as uh, just in general, uh, things that we're doing here and, and technology that we're working on here in the in our facility at our headquarters. Um, but yeah, so other than that, uh, that was everything for today. And I will jump into our Q and A. Looks like we have five questions. Um, so the first question from Kevin Fort uh, is: Tissue water content variability more likely to show up in NIR spectroscopy compared with 300 to 1200 nanometer spectroscopy. So uh, if you're asking about whether or not water content is easy, more easily measured, if you're looking at 780 to 2500 versus 300 to 1200, 
Um, honestly, water content is the easiest thing to measure. So it's very easily identifiable in both. Um, both of those wavelength ranges are going to have uh, enough uh, information in the spectra to easily uh, model tissue water content. Um, with using 780 to 2500, uh, there is the risk of having maybe too much information, which can sometimes overwhelm uh, um, the models. Uh, and so if you actually narrow it down to only focusing on certain wavelengths, then it can it can sometimes make things better, but uh, not always. So it, honestly, it, it both both ways are equally as likely to be successful in modeling water content. Um, the next question uh, is from an anonymous attendee: Can NIR spectroscopy be used with an S750 Produce meter that is running on version 1.2.0 build 7041? Uh, okay, so to this person, uh, I will say one, uh, all of the 750 and 751s are using NIR spectroscopy as the base, that is the base technology of the devices. Um, and so everything's already using that technology. The firmware version that you're referring to uh, uh, is is just more of a, a kind of computer logistics kind of thing. So as we update firmwares, we update functionality and ability to use things like App Builder as the software, where previously we had a version of, of, of a software called Model Builder that was um, less functional than App Builder is. And so if you want to uh, update your instrument, uh, please reach out to our support team. And uh, if you just go to our website, you can uh, go to the support page and just uh, submit a request to um, uh, start a support ticket and we can get you upgraded so you can use the newest app builder uh, software if you want. Uh, uh, so it's a little um, more smooth and more functional for you and more, I guess, intuitive. Um, the next question from Serge is, uh, why do you limit yourself to fruit industry only? What about grasses, corn, rice, which grass, et cetera, trees, et cetera? Um, well, really, when we're talking about, uh, I guess, when we're looking at new product development, uh, one of the biggest things is, 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 you know, looking at customer needs, what's, what technology is already out there, uh, you know, what the market's like. Um, and so, you know, we do have a... Uh, device actually for, that is on our CID bioscience side of the industry or of our business that is um, called the CI710S SpectraView. And that is actually a leaf spectrometer. So it's using the exact same NAR technology, but it's actually meant to be used on leaves and it can be used on things like grasses or corn leaves. And that's to a kind of more to assess plant health, right? At, at the actual plant level and not really on the product level, like not actually on the corn cob or, or the end product. Um, with the fruit industry, um, really it started as a, you know, a kind of there was a gap to fill because in things like corn, wheat, rice, soy, large, large, uh, you know, uh, industries that have already existed, um, we have a lot of technology out there already, NAR technology that has been developed and honed over years and years and years to uh, help, you know, assess the quality of, of those products um, after, and mostly after they've been harvested. Um, uh, and so that's why I guess we really haven't kind of switched. So we haven't really necessarily dedicated ourselves to those industries. Um, but like I said, if you're looking interested in mostly and more of the plant health, then we do have that leaf spectrometer actually that can be used. Uh, the next question from Christopher. Oh, I just missed it. Uh, oh, wait, no, I guess I I skipped a question here. This is 4, oh, it's 4.02 a.m., okay. Uh, adding to query by Surge, can it be used for analyzing milk, fruit juices, and the like? Um, so we don't currently have a liquid format. That is actually something that we've been looking at for developing in our pipeline. There are uh, uh, other analyzers out there that are meant for uh, looking at liquids, specifically like milk and fruit juices. 
Um, and so what I would do if I were you is to maybe uh, do some research into looking up liquid spectrometers and seeing or liquid spectroscopy analyzers or something like that in your search. Uh, and there are manufacturers out there that are, are producing uh, um, uh, spectrometers that do and analyzers for uh, milk and fruit juices and stuff like that. Right now, the 750 and 751, uh, I 0% recommend trying to put liquid on those because it will likely ruin the instrument. Uh, the next question from Christopher is uh, one unit for multiple products, question mark. And uh, the answer is yes, the 750 that I mentioned, uh, the F750 uh, is a open-ended research unit. And actually uh, that unit comes with calibrations for the calibrations for avocado dry matter, mango dry matter and bricks, um, red, gold, and Hayward kiwi fruit uh, for bricks, hue, and uh, dry matter, um, as well as some other uh, proof of concept models that we've developed. Um, and so that the 750, you can put uh, uh, apps for multiple different commodities, and each of those apps that hold for each of those commodities can have models for multiple different analytes. So um, yes, that is the device that you would be uh, most, uh, I guess, looking for if you wanted to do multiple products. Uh, so the another, another great question here is uh, from an anonymous attendee. As you showed in the early slides, a model needs to be related to other parameters, such as bricks or dry matter. What are other common parameters used? It's a great question. It really is more of a question of what are the industry standards for uh, your commodity. And so uh, a lot of people will look at things like uh, maybe like titratable acidity in uh, grapes, right? Or um, color is a very common one, both internal and external color. Uh, people will oftentimes look at things like firmness. Uh, and there's also uh, sometimes uh, people that are interested in, in more nuanced uh, aspects of their product, uh, things more like, uh, you know, protein content or fat content, stuff like that. Um, but usually it's, it's between things like water content, things that affect end consumer acceptance, water content, sweetness, acidity, color, firmness. So... Uh, and, 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 you know, oftentimes also there are things like uh, not necessarily trying to quantify a analyte, but looking at defects. So maybe there's a common defect or disease um, that is present uh, in, in a lot of the fruit that you harvest. And so uh, it can also be used in that regard to identify uh, and sort out uh, those uh, kinds of parameters. So the next question from Jessica is, do differences in ambient light uh, temperature influence readings in thin samples like leafy greens? Uh, so things that affect, and this is actually a great question, things that influence uh, spectra are temperature and pH. So if the temperature of the sample is really high or really low, and the model that you built was at room temperature, then you're going to see uh, differences in that spectra from the room temperature than you saw at the high temperature that versus low temperature. And so you when you're considering how you're using this inst how you're using these devices, you have to keep that in, in mind when you're building your models. Same with pH. If you know that pH levels are going to vary in whatever you're measuring, then this is going to this is going to really tie into the next uh, part when we're talking about sampling plans, but um, if you know that pH is going to vary, then you're going to want to make sure you're building that variability into your model. Um, as far as ambient light, though, is concerned, as I mentioned, we have a reference shutter in our devices um, that actually uh, 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 is used to account for whatever lighting conditions you're measuring in. So it's going to reference that light against the spectra, so it's actually correcting for whatever light conditions you're in. Um, and so that should not influence your uh, the readings for uh, your samples, the lighting, but temperature and pH both will. Uh, the next question from Andres is, uh, has this equipment been used for soil analysis? Um, and so NIR spectroscopy has been used for soil analysis. I personally don't know of anyone that's used the 750 necessarily for soil analysis. 
Um, but uh, as I mentioned, with the liquid spectrometer um, that we're that we're is in our uh, you know our product development pipeline, um, you essentially could in, you know use soil like you know uh, and in replacement of the liquid, fill up a you know cubet or, or whatever hole uh, holster is there for the liquid uh, for the device and put soil in it instead and then analyze the soil that way. Um, but no, as far as I'm concerned, no one that I know has used it really for soil analysis. Um, but if you're interested in it, I'm more than happy to have a one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one chat with you if you want to uh, email me directly or set up a consultation to talk about it further. Uh, the next question, uh, the F751 series have been made referencing the popular varieties of the fruit type. Does this become a limiting factor with the F750? Uh, so I think what this question is asking is, uh, is there anything limiting what you can measure with a 750? And the answer is no. Um, the only thing that limits what you can actually use the 750 with is the ability of the NIR light to penetrate into the tissue that you are interested in, in analyzing. So the I worded that in that way because think of something like a pineapple or a grapefruit or like a citrus with a really thick rind. Um, if the rind is too thick or watermelon is a great example. NIR light is great at penetrating, but it can't penetrate through all the way through an entire watermelon rind and into the flesh of the watermelon and that if the flesh of the watermelon is what you're interested in measuring you're not going to get unless the rind it has a specific uh constant correlation with what's happening uh in the flesh you're not going to get any kind of uh you know good modeling out of out of using the 750 or the 751 with a on a intact watermelon or a uh, pineapple because it's the outside is too irregular and too thick. Um, so uh, the limiting factor isn't necessarily the equipment, but more so the target of what you're going to, the sample that you're going to be measuring. The 751s are limited to the fruit that we are assigned them to. Uh, the next question, uh, follow or few mango varieties have spongy tissue issues. Does the spectra look beyond the stone? Um, so as I mentioned, the light penetrates into uh, the fruit, uh, depending on the thickness of the rind, it, it penetrates, you know, it can penetrate up to, uh, you know, one, one to two centimeters, at, usually typically at most two centimeters. Um, uh, but typically between around one centimeter. So we actually are avoiding measuring the stone and avoiding measuring the, uh, if we're looking at avocado, measuring the pit of the avocado, um, and we're only looking at the flesh. And so uh, you can look as deep as the uh, light can penetrate, but then you can also, if spongy tissue, so here's what's, great about multivariate data analysis. If spongy tissue has an effect that is a some kind of relationship between what's happening uh what's happening on the flesh that you're measuring or the you know the part that you're measuring with the light, then the multivariate data analysis can actually pick up on that and actually from that relationship it can still form like a secondary kind of uh, uh, re uh relationship between what you're measuring and the spongy tissue level if there's a, a constant effect between the spongy tissue level and what you're measuring. So um, hopefully that answers your question. There's a lot of ways in which this technology can model uh, uh, stuff that isn't necessarily a direct uh, you know, um, uh, measurement of the tissue that is being analyzed. So uh, I, I do know that there's been research with spongy tissue and that it is a something that can be uh, modeled uh, or classified at least. The stone acts as a barrier to detecting bad tissues in the flesh. Okay, so uh, if the stone is acting as a barrier, then yes, you're likely not, as I mentioned, you're not going to be penetrating that far enough to even get to the stone, let alone penetrate through it to the other side. Uh, if that's what you are meaning. Um, so what's happening is your light is going into the mango 
only a certain distance into the flesh, and that's the limit of how far the NIR is penetrating. Um, and then, uh, so that's the information that you're directly measuring. If there's something happening between the bad tissue and the good tissue, then you can still find ways to correlate those and model that based on the direct measurement of the good tissue is what I'm, I guess I'm trying to uh, say. Uh, the next question is uh, following on the question about parameters, can shelf life be predicted? Um, actually, yes. So there have been studies where shelf life is predicted. I've seen this in, um, I believe, spinach or some other leafy greens before um, where uh, they mo actually did like a shelf life uh, model. So it's not necessarily a, they didn't actually measure any specific parameters. They just took a series of spectra throughout the shelf life uh, and the day value was kind of, I think the, the um, or the, the day, the number of days that had been on the shelf was their, their analytical, I guess, kind of reference values. Um, but they were able to successfully model the shelf life uh, with um, the devices. Yeah. Uh, strawberries pre and post harvest. Absolutely. Strawberries are uh, berries of all kinds are going to be uh, uh, easily measurable. Um, mostly because, you know, they are a small, smaller and B, uh, the, uh, usually tend to be a little bit, uh, um, you know, thinner skinned and so easy for the light to transmit and pass through that and penetrate, um, and get more information about what's going on. So strawberries absolutely can be modeled. Um, the next question is, can the SM51 for avocado measure other parameters? Um, the avocado meter only measures dry matter, um, which is directly correlated to oil content. And that so dry matter has ever since the relationship between dry matter and oil content has kind of been, uh, you know, researched and sussed out as being a very direct relationship, direct correlation. Um, people have switched over to measuring dry matter because it's easier to model water than it is, is to model things like oil, which is the actual, you know, thing that people are concerned about and care about. Um, but if you did want to model other things in avocados, it is possible, um, but you would want to use the 7, F750 if you wanted to measure uh, other parameters with the avocado besides dry matter. Uh, so the next question is, how accurately can we predict shelf life? Do you recommend taking multiple readings over a time span to document any changes? Absolutely. Definitely you want to take multiple readings. Um, I highly recommend that you attend the next section of this or the next part of the series of this webinar where we talk about sample plans and analy analytical testing. Um, I think that'll help provide a lot of insight into how uh, robust you need to be when creating your um, sampling plan for doing modeling. But um, yes, uh, as far as accuracy, that's going to be completely up to how robust the model is. Uh, it's, uh, a, it's a factor of how well you can collect data as well as how good the uh, chemometric multivariate data analysis is. Uh, the next question, reflection absorption for tomato. I, I I think it just says IR. Um, I'm not 100% sure what this is asking, but you can get um, both of those spectra out of the device. Um, if you are asking, if you don't currently have a device and are trying to ask how to get those spectral, uh, those, those two, the reflection and the reflectance and the absorbance spectra out of the device, let me know. Um, you can email us directly, our support team directly, and we can help you get those uh, spectra um, for that. But yes, those you can acquire both of those spectra, and you definitely can use it in tomato. A lot of people have done tomato in the past uh, with this device. Uh, the next question, this is a great question. Uh, since calcium content is related to apple storability, can you discriminate samples using NAR spectroscopy due to changes in cell walls or to model cell wall dynamics during apple development and storage? Well, uh, 
this certainly so cell wall changes in cell walls uh and also cell wall dynamics actually are do uh influence and our nir spectra um physical changes like that are you know just as much of a factor as the chemical changes that we see in the in the bonds of the actual you know um chemical constituents within the flesh um and so yeah you could in theory develop models that kind of track those changes in cell wall dynamics the hard part i think is would be how how exactly you come up with a scale and this the next section the next uh, part of the series will be great for you as well but trying to figure out how you like what's the scale that you're using what is the because it's still a class of, it's a if it's a classification model you still need some kind of reference thing to compare it to so you can make up your own I guess scale to say uh you know this is uh you know looking at changes in cell walls early to uh late development stages and then you have a storage classification um and then within those you have like a, a spectrum that you're using of uh uh, you know, zero to 10 and for different, to identify um, the different cell wall, uh, I guess, changes in the cell wall. So I, there still needs to be some consideration in that regard, but yes, you could theoretically do that. Uh, so the next question is, following up on the earlier question, is there a reason that we use 350 to 1100 rather than 850 to 2500 nanometers? Um, are there issues with the measurements and analyses done in these longer wavelengths? No. So actually, Kevin, the reason we're using the shorter wave NIR, the 350 or invisible to NIR, um, is that in a lot of cases, the visible spectrum still gives us useful information when it comes to things like quality, things like color and stuff like that. But also spectrometers in the 850 to 2500 nanometer range, um, first of all, are typically not in a format where we can put them in a portable device um, and also uh, are not as usually as high of resolution as the shorter wavelength ones we get um, if we want really high resolution spectrometers um, in the 850 to eight, you know 800 to 200 2500 nanometer range um, uh, then those are larger spectrometers but they're also very expensive so if we want this technology to be accessible to people that, uh, you know, like like farmers and and, and people that are doing uh, innovations in ag tech that necessarily don't have the budgets for uh, um, these 850, these these more expensive spectrometers. Uh, that's why we, we can still get the modeling capacity for a lot of the key analytes that most uh, people are concerned with, with the lower range spectrometer that is much more affordable and more easily put into a portable format. Um, the the spectrometers that go up to 2500 nanometers are almost always installed in the bench top of uh, uh instruments that the ones that i mentioned earlier in the presentation those bench top instruments are uh typically the ones that have the higher range all the whole nir spec uh, spectrum range um the next question is can they be paired with barcode readers and that is a great question serge and i'm pretty sure the answer is yes I think we developed a co I actually Serge if you want please reach out directly to me I feel like we recently actually did uh create um uh a custom app for a customer that uh had the ability to be used with barcode scanners to fill in all that metadata and organizational data as they scan so yes um uh it absolutely can be and it has done has been done before um, but if you want that uh, capability, just let us know and we can uh, help you out with that. Uh, the next question is, can you send a detailed information to all participants about the main competitors and our advantages against their similar models? Um, so, yeah, if you're looking for comparisons between the seven, the ARP, the Felix Instruments portable uh, quality sensors versus um, someone like, uh, uh, why am I blanking on the name? Sunforest or, or another one of those, or uh, uh, Sio or those other portable NIR t uh, companies, then um, uh, if you're interested in that information, reach out to us directly and we can uh, help provide uh, comparison information. 
Uh, the next question is we are dealing in potatoes uh, and potatoes are absolutely just as easily you uh, can be modeled just as easily as any other commodity like apples or anything like that. So yeah, any kind of potato, sweet potato, russet, whatever you're doing, gold, uh, whatever it is, you can definitely model with the S750. Uh, the next question is, is it possible for you slash Felix to create a matrix with fruit, veg, and possible parameters? Okay, so you're looking for a, a pos like what uh, commodities uh, are, are able to be modeled and what parameters uh, are able to be modeled with those uh, different commodities. We actually do have a infographic like that, that uh, does show, uh, uh, what it shows is things that we have either tested in house or things that are in the literature that have been tested with this technology and the parameters that they, or, or we have measured with that. And so we actually have an infographic for that we can send. Okay. Um, please send us your email if you want that, because uh, since you're an anonymous attendee, uh, then uh, we can get that to you if you want it. Uh, just send us an email directly and we'll get it to you. Next question. When you take measurements in the fruit in the orchard, you have to avoid light. Light might interfere with the reading. So actually with our device, the reference shutter actually eliminates that. And we've actually done studies to show that the light conditions actually do not influence in the field. Uh, what is happening with the uh, scanning uh, and what the results of the scans. Uh, and so um, results of that uh, most recent study actually that we did uh, was in kiwi fruit uh, and kiwi fruit orchards. And, uh, and if you are interested in looking and seeing that data, I can most certainly uh, show it to you. Just feel free to reach out directly and I can uh, send you that data. Next question, what about apples and other fruits like pears? easily modeled both of them and have been uh, by plenty of researchers. Uh, we have a couple of different researchers right now that are actively modeling apple, uh, different traits in apples and pears. Um, and so uh, if you want to uh, uh, use the F750 for that, then you absolutely can. Uh, the next question, what is the time required for measuring solids or dry matter in potatoes? Um, and so the amount of time you put into the model building process um, is going to be determined by how robust and how accurate you need the model to be. Uh, and also, uh, as if you're more concerned about uh, how long it actually takes to do a scan, a uh, single scan time is usually around uh, 10 to 15 seconds at most. So um, that's how long it would take after you built the model, how long it would take for you to get a single data point. Um, for solids in a potato, but the mop the I would highly recommend you attend the next section, the next um, part of this series, so that uh, you can uh, get more insight into the how robust the model building process needs to be. All right, three questions left. Is there any scope to measure sugar levels in potato, especially sucrose and glucose content instantly in fields? The problem with differentiating sucrose and glucose with NIR spectroscopy, as I mentioned, there's a lot of, the data is kind of convoluted, right? The spectra is, there's combination bands, there's overtone bands, and there's, that's why we have to use multivariate analysis to even get out, pull out any of this information. And it really, NIR isn't that great of a technology for identifying specific chemicals. Um, so the mid-infrared region, right, where I told you where that fundamental, those fundamental vibrations are, that's great. Or something like Raman spectroscopy or FTIR spectroscopy, those are great technologies for identifying like a specific chemicals. They have more distinct bands for, for uh, different uh, chemicals. Um, but uh, NIR is a little more, the bands kind of overlap and they're kind of more broad. So it's easier to just do sugar content overall rather and it's going to be more difficult to do a breakdown of sucrose and glucose. Um, so if you want to go that route, it's going to be like, it's going to be more work and harder and probably less successful to go with measuring individual sugar levels as opposed to just overall sugar content. 
Um, the next question is, what is the best model to use? That is a great question. I am partial to kiwi fruit because I like it, uh, but uh, it really all depends on what the best uh, uh, the best model for you is going to be. What is the commodity that you're using, and um, you know what do you want to measure? What kind of parameters do you want to measure? Uh, so the uh, if you're asking about how to choose the best model. That is something that's going to come up in a new uh, one of the uh, upcoming sections, as I mentioned, uh, upcoming parts of this webinar series. So stick around for that. Uh, the next question, is it possible to measure chlorophyll and fruit tree leaves? Absolutely. Um, you can do that with, uh, you could do that with like the 750 or 751, but we do, as I mentioned, have the 710S SpectraView, which is a great device for uh, measuring uh, the actual leaves. Uh, I see there's a question here that I missed for, can I use a 751 for apples and plums? Uh, absolutely, you can use it for both. Uh, it has been done for both stone fruits and for apples and pears, as I mentioned. And then last question from Brandon, um, uh, following up on a previous question, is a 710S spectra view sensitive to ambient light? Oh, 710S. So I guess maybe the, the light question wasn't about the 751, but more about the 710. I might have misread that, um, but since it's a clip light construct, um, no, you're not sensitive to ambient light because it's it's a closed environment, uh, essentially, uh, so that you won't be sensitive to ambient light uh, with 710S. And that is the last question, and we have to, I have to log off here, we're definitely over time, um, but I really appreciate uh, everyone's questions, and I appreciate the uh, you know, the, all the questions that everyone asked and the feedback. Um, if you need to reach out to us directly, please feel free to do so. Uh, if you have further questions, if I didn't get around to answering your question or I didn't answer it in a way that you wanted me to, uh, just feel free to send us an email and I will, um, you know, elaborate on it further and, and we can uh, make sure we can come to a, a good conclusion. And uh, all this, uh, uh, everyone will receive a recording of this. If, if I didn't mention that already, uh, it's everyone should receive a recording of this. If you're registered and you didn't attend, you still get a recording. Everyone everyone that was registered gets a recording of this at the end of the webinar um, once it's been processed. So thank you everyone so much.